where we're going to go to this morning, back to the book of Revelation. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go. And uh, as they say, fasten our seatbelts, yes? Much to get through. I know ambitiously, last time I was with you, uh, before Colin was here last week, I set out to go through the seven seals and kind of halfway dealt with one. But be that as it may, praise God, you know, there's no rush when we go through the Word of God. And uh, always encourage house groups as well, you know, there's no race, there's no rush. We can spend sometimes our whole evening just looking at one verse, you know, provided we do so in context and look at the whole surrounding text and all that as well. But uh, uh, God's Word is living and powerful, amen. And when we look, come to His Word as we do this morning again, there is a special blessing in this special book, the last book of the Bible that we know by now, don't we? In Revelation 1 verse 3, and Colin read this out when he was with us last Sunday evening as well. And it says, blessed is he who reads, amen. So we, I'm reading it, you reading it this morning as well. And those who hear, yes, we're going to have listening ears this morning to hear what the Lord would say. The words of this prophecy. I think it's so important for us to understand that the book of Revelation is a prophecy. Yes, many, many things as we shall see this morning even by God's grace is yet future. And we are waiting for these things to take place. And keep those things which are written it, for the time is near. And of all the generations, we can say this morning, the time is near. Yes, Jesus is coming, <laughs> my friends. Things are happening at a rapid rate. And we often say that we can see that we are at the end of the end times. And I hope you can see that with me this morning. So we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 6. And I'm going to read it through again, um, just so that it sticks in our minds, but it is always good for us to, to read it, and then we'll see how the Lord leads us, how far we get this morning. So Revelation chapter 6 from verse 1, it says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, or with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword." When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. I looked, and he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath 
of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Lord, we recognize this is your word that you have given to us, preserved for us throughout the ages. And this, come this morning, we come with fear and trembling and awe, thanking you for your word. But Lord, we want to claim that blessing that it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear and those who keep the words of this prophecy. And we just ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would truly open our ears, open our hearts and open our minds to see, Lord, what it is you are saying. Speak to us. You know exactly where we're at this morning. And I just ask that your word would go forth in great power this morning. And Lord, as you show us things even yet to come, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you could just also kindly, just quickly also turn to Matthew 24, please. Um, these two great passages really do go together, as we know. And uh, I, 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 we went through it last time uh, I was with you. And you can really put these seven seals together with Matthew 24 and see this, uh, the, the chronology in, in, in this as well. Um, and of course, that famous question that the disciples asked Jesus about what will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age, and Jesus gives them this great, great teaching, yes, um, that we know, um, teaching, speaking of the end times. And if you want to understand things of the end times, these are some of the key passages you have to understand and, and, and look at. Daniel 9, you know, 11, 12, many, many other passages, but specifically Matthew 24 and, uh, you know, the synoptics around that. And then also the book of Revelation, as we know. And this, oh, there's so many places we could go to that look to things yet future, yes? So many prophecies were fulfilled with Jesus' first coming, but you know so much of the Bible. In fact, much, most of the prophecies we told look to Jesus' second coming. So there's so much of the Bible that is yet to be fulfilled. And we can know that these things will be fulfilled because you only have to look back. We have the luxury of looking back and seeing how many things have been fulfilled. Every single one of them, the very life and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, even at that moment when he was on the cross, within minutes and within an hour, so many prophecies were fulfilled. It would have been impossible for a human being to orchestrate that. And so we know that prophecy is so true. And there's a reason that God tells us things uh, uh, up front. You know, as one of the prophets say, surely God will do nothing unless he first reveals it through his servants, the prophets. He wants us, his people, to know so that we are forewarned, that we can walk in his truth and in his ways. Yes? It's what sets the Bible aside from any other book, my friends. It's why it's called the Holy Bible. Holy, set apart, not like any other book. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, uh, uh, verse 25, he just says these very key words that I want us to remember. See, I have told you beforehand. See, I have told you beforehand. You know, there's something, you know, we're focusing as a church on outreach and going out. And, you know, we can all easily make it just a church growth thing. But it's so much more than that. It's to go and tell people the truth. Yes? Because one day our neighbors and those people close around about us, if we weren't a good witness unto them, and one day their eyes finally see the things that are written in the book of Revelation, and they surely will take place. You know, God forbid that they should turn around and point at me and you and say, why did you not tell me? If you knew this, you had this truth, why did you not tell me? And you know, God, is nobody's going to be able on that day of judgment be ever be able to point the finger at God and to say to him, this is not fair. Because Jesus came and lived this life and he even told us the things when they asked him. And this is, those, those words keep ringing in my ears. See, I have told you beforehand. So all these things that Jesus tells them in Matthew 24, about the wars and the rumors of wars and the famines and all those things, and we can see how those things pertain to the end times. And so last week, when I, or last time I was with you, we looked particularly at that first seal, the rider on the white horse, and many, many people agree that this is like the riding out of the Antichrist, the false Messiah. Jesus said there will be many false Christs that will rise up and deceive many who say, I have an anointing, I have anointing, I've come in the name of the Lord. 
and they will lead many astray. And we as a church know that there's so many of these letters in the Bible that speak over and over and over against deception. We must make sure we are well versed in the Word of God. Yes? <laughs> How easily, I mean, my friends, it makes me shudder to think how easily I can stand up here and mislead you through my own personal views and my own way of speech. You know, we think of this morning we spoke about Adolf Hitler. You know, he had that gift, if you like, of speech. And with that, to sway the multitudes into a powerful deception. The only thing that will set us free is the truth, is the word of God, yes? Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I can't make you read the Bible for yourself, but I can only encourage you and urge you, as we said last week, the very reason these things are coming upon the earth, these judgments, the deception, is because people did not receive the love of the truth. Yes? And in Romans 1, it talks about they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Yeah? How many people have you even maybe in your family? You talk to them, you witness to them, and you tell them, and they may even say, yeah, I know these things, but I don't want to know them now. <laughs> okay? Later in life. You can see how they literally suppress and unrighteousness in, un in their unrighteousness because they want to live their life, yes? They want to live the way they do. And the thing is, the Bible says very clearly, God will give them over to a strong delusion. It's a very slippery slope. And, you know, so when we read these things in the book of Revelation, that many people avoid, as we know, I always take a bit of time on this, just to help us understand, because people want to avoid it, because it sounds so catastrophic and so horrible, and this angry God pouring out his wrath upon this earth. Keep in the back of our minds, Jesus says, see, I've told you beforehand. And then to remember, as we did this morning, see what Jesus has done for us, so that we don't have to go through these things. Yes? And hopefully we'll see that. So last week, or well, last time we spoke about this conqueror on the white horse, and uh, it was given to him uh, uh, this, this authority, this crown, and he went out conquering and to conquer, and it's like a deception. So what we see here is the seals being unfolded or opened by the very lamb. Yes, it was the lamb that was slain. Uh, we know this by now, hopefully. Okay, it's Jesus himself that opens the scroll. Looses. He's the only one that was found worthy. Okay? So we see this deception, as it were, go out. And this, I believe, these following seals are all the repercussions, if you like, of what will take place. So Mr. Antichrist, as we know, is going to come along and deceive many nations. And the Bible talks about when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, okay? So there's going to be a false sense of world peace, if you like, that I believe the Bible speaks of in the end times, that everyone will breathe a sigh of relief and say, finally, peace and safety. And the Bible says sudden destruction, as I believe we'll read this morning, will come upon them and they shall not escape. But who are those who do escape? It's the born-again believers of Jesus, his church, yes? I hope we understand that this morning. So we pick it up from verse 3 of Revelation chapter 6. It says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that the people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. You know, I found it interesting. This was left on the pulpit here this morning. One of the children made me a sword. I think it's great. <laughs> but I don't think that's the sword that Jesus is talking about here. The Bible's talking about, okay? A great sword. Now, we know what the sword of the Spirit is, yes? It's the Word of God. And so this is not the sword of the Spirit, as, as it were. This is a sword to slay men, okay? This is, a, this, is a, this is a woe. This is a judgment that is coming upon this earth, okay? And only Jesus is the one who's found worthy to open this seal. So this fiery red horse, it went out, and it was granted to the one who sat in it to take peace from the earth. Do you know that peace, even as we know it today, okay, in the worldly sense, is a gift from God, 
If there's a lack of war and fighting and all these things, that is a gift from God. You know, somebody once described, who, 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 who claims that they'd had a visitation to hell as an experience. I'm always a bit skeptical when I hear these things. But I remember somebody once spoke, and they said they had a real experience of what hell could possibly be like. And it was completely and utterly devoid of anything from God in that sense. You know, we can go to the darkest, stinkiest, rotten pit on this earth and think this is hell on earth, okay? But still there'll be something of God's grace and his mercy there. Life, breath of life, sunshine perhaps, some kind of peace. Now hell, I believe, is completely and utterly devoid of all those things. And the very peace that we even see, even in our time, my friends, as much as there are rumors of wars and threats of wars, the very peace that we see is a gift from God. And of course, we can look back over history. The World Wars is a great example for us. The privilege, if you like, to look back over the horrors of that. And many people like to say, well, there it is. That's got to be the seals that have been opened there already. I mean, that is war on a massive scale. My friends, I firmly believe with many others uh, that study this book, Book of Revelation, that those wars are going to be eclipsed by the things that we see in the time of the tribulation. I want to be very clear this morning. Our stance as a church here, and I believe it with my whole heart, is that these seven seals and this things that we are reading now is talking about the tribulation. That last seven years, okay? I don't have time to go through all of it again this morning, but remember, very important for us to understand those 70 weeks of Daniel, found in Daniel chapter 9, is pertaining to God's people Israel. Okay? And so this last seven-year period will be kicked off any day now, I believe, any year now. We'll turn God's focus back on his people, Israel. And as we heard last Sunday night from Colin, and we'll look at it again, 144,000 super evangelists, the two witnesses, great revival will take place in that seven-year period, very short space of time, concentrated time of God's wrath being poured out on this earth, but at the same time, probably the greatest revival this world has ever seen. And we'll see that as we go through the book of Revelation. But these are like the birth pangs that Jesus said in Matthew 24. These seals that are being opened, it's but the beginning of the sorrows, okay? And so he opens a seal, and it was given to this, per, this, this rider on the red horse, and it was to take peace from the earth, and that their people should kill one another. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And as we've said before, it's, it's like ethnic group against ethnic group. Don't you see this today, my friends? I come from a country that is very racially divided. And I've seen, even in my time, a little bit of the tension and the hatred around that. And you can look across the globe, and this is everywhere now. Racial tension. Ethnic group against ethnic group. Even families turning on each other. And it was given to this rider of the red horse. And this is also very important for us to understand in terms of God's judgments, God's wrath being poured out. You know, in the book of Job, what did Satan himself say to God when God said to him, have you considered my righteous servant Job? And Satan himself said to God, he said, but that's only because you put a hedge around him. <laughs> you know, remove that and see if he will still serve you. And we know that amazing story of the person of Job. But this is something so important for us to understand, especially as the blood-washed saints of Jesus Christ Satan himself knows <laughs> he's only got as much authority as has been given to him. Do you see this? And so all these things we even see in the book of Revelation, it is not uncontrolled. It is not just like God has turned his eyes away as it were and everything's just going to ensue, chaos is going to ensue. No, this great sword was given to him, okay? Given to him. And at any moment, God can take it away. These are the seven seals that are being opened by the very lamb that was slain. What a price he paid. The only one found in all the heaven and earth and under the earth. No one else was found worthy as we've looked before. 
only the Lamb of God. And as he opens these things, these are like God's woes, God's judgments unfolding on this earth. Because my friends, as Jesus said, they are like birth pangs, okay? They, they start with one contraction of, I'm not a lady as you know, so I've never given birth. I have no idea. So sympathize with ladies <laughs> that go through this, okay? But it starts with that contraction and it's, you know, spaced out. But as you get closer to the time, it's more intense, more severe. But at the end of all the agony and the pain and the suffering comes this wonderful gift of life. You know, life that started right back at conception. It's now birthed into this world. And Jesus likens it to that, my friends. So as we get right to the end, when Jesus, before he comes back for his second coming, they're going to be these birth pangs. My friends, incredible, incredible pressure, if you like. And so from this writer, this first uh, uh, scenario that we see, this deception, and then the secondly, this peace that is taken, so that people should kill one another, and a great sword. And you know, you can look at Jeremiah 25, verse 16 to 35 in your own time and read that through. And I believe there are Old Testament passages that talk of that. You can make a note, 20, Jeremiah 25, 16 to 38. And you'll see how many times it talks about the great sword. And the slain of the Lord will be from one end to the other. And it talks about all the nations, my friends. These are, again, I believe, prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. All the way back, even in Jeremiah's time. And remind ourselves of those words Jesus said, See, I have told you beforehand. These things will surely come. Times such as we have never seen. And indeed, again, we can study the books of history and see terrible, terrible, terrible injustices, gross murder, violence, all those things. But this was given to them. And then we read in verse 5, And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on had a pair of scales or balances, like they used in the old days. In his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for Daenerys, and three quarts of barley for Daenerys, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is talking, all scholars agree on this that study this. This is talking about great scarcity on the earth. And you and I, again, we have the privilege of hindsight and the history books today. We only need to look to World War I, World War II, and we can look at all the time after that, my friends. What comes after a mass-scale war? It's, it, it is scarcity. The amount of money that is pumped into warfare is it's unreal if you think the massive amount of money that they spend, helicopters, war equipment, all the bombs and the things that they make. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And with all that money being thrown into just warfare, I mean, it's only obvious that after that there's going to be a great scarcity on the earth and the destruction. And when we're talking about even a bigger scale than World War I and II, you can imagine the scarcity that takes place. And you know, they tell us, when it says they're a quart of wheat for a Daenerys and three quarts of barley for a Daenerys, that is... Like they'd say, your daily rations of food that will cost you a day's wage. Now, if you think that through, my friends, all your hard work, all your labor, just enough to stay alive. It is like the bare necessities. <laughs> you know, was that bear that used to sing the bare necessities of life? But this is going to be a terrible time on the earth, my friends. And Jesus says, see, I have told you beforehand. Why is he telling us these things? Because this is the judgment that must take place upon a world that rejects the very Son of God and the free gift of salvation. There can be no other way. You know, somebody just asked me this week, just as a question that they were thinking through, why? They're just trying to get their head around the cross, but why? Why did Jesus have to suffer so much, so brutally? I mean, yes, he had to go to the cross. He had to shed his blood for us. But why did it have to be so brutal? Why did it have to be so violent? That even when they make movies of it, they have to rate it 18 because of violence. It's too much for us to handle. Why did it have to be like that? Well, my simple and short answer is, my friends, 
That is the price it costs for our sin. That shows us something of God's attitude, a holy God that is set apart, as it were, from all the wickedness. No wickedness, no pride, no arrogance can stand in his sight. That is what it cost for redemption. And so when you and I sin, and we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I've sinned again, and we confess our sins, and it says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But we can always remember this is no small thing. There was a reason Jesus had to go through these things. And so when we look yet future, this is the lamb. Remember, it's the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. John saw him as the lamb that was slain. As he opens that, you always have the picture of the lamb that was slain. Nobody can say, but God, this is unfair. But God, why are you pouring out your anger? Why are you so angry? Because that picture is always there of the lamb that was slain. It's Jesus. Who was Jesus? He was God in the flesh. He was the son of God. Nobody, I repeat, nobody is ever going to be able to point the finger at God and say, this is not fair. My friends, this is what you and I deserve. This is what a world deserves that rejects the free gift of God through his son. And Jesus came to make a way, my friend. The great light has come into this world. <laughs> Amen. But how sad that it would say that men prefer darkness and not the light. And so God in his grace and his mercy, my friends, before he sends the king to come back to this earth, will have everybody know who his son is. And it's through this wrath, through this outpouring of his judgment, and through the sending of the 144,000 and the two witnesses and even the angels who fly to and fro, God's grace and his mercy is there. And we see people come to faith even in the book, uh, in, the, in the tribulation, even if they pay with their lives. Because that is what it says. And so we see the scarcity on the earth, my friends. Pestilences, famines, shortage. I was just looking this week poorest country in the world, Burundi, for like the last 60 years. It's astonishing to see how those people live. If you ever want a reality check, just go look it up. How do people live in Burundi right now? You'll never complain again of the things that we have in this country. But this is talking about a global, as it were, I believe, scarcity on the earth. All your wages you earn just to keep you and your family alive. What an awful time this is going to be that very short time when they say ah oh, peace and safety just like that all these things ensue seven years my friends is a short time in human history for these things to take place and then it talks about do not harm the oil and the wine and i've heard so many different interpretations people say don't really understand what that means and there are so many different things there. And I, I get excited by these things because I believe when the time comes, we'll know what that means. That to me is like another sign that the Bible is yet looking future. Because there's so many things even now, like we think of the birth of Israel, not the birth, but Israel going back into the land in 1948. So many prophecies now make sense that that's now happened. Do you see? After the Six-Day War, all these things, there's prophecies that now make sense that probably previously didn't make sense. But as the time unfolds and you read it, as Jesus said, see, I told you beforehand. You think, I see it. Now, I believe that's what it's probably going to be with this, do not harm the oil and the wine. But there are passages in the Bible where it talks about the oil and the wine as sort of luxury items. And you know, there are prophecies in the Bible where it talks about in the last days, the rich will grow rich and the poor will grow poorer, yeah? And we can see this even in our time now. The rich looking after the rich. And you've got countries like Burundi and others, you know, for various reasons. Corruption, all kinds of things. But they grow poorer and poorer and poorer. And the wealthy get wealthy and wealthy and wealthier. And indeed, when we even see them hiding in the rocks and the caves, my friends, the wealthy today, if you don't know, are spending a lot of their money investing in underground bunkers, apocalyptic bunkers. Did you know that? In 2020, I read an article, they were saying that there was a huge surge. People can't keep ahead of the demand for underground bunkers. What do these super wealthy people know that we don't? <laughs> yeah? 
And the Bible even says they'll hide in the caves, but what will they do? They will beg for these rocks to fall on them in light of the glory of the, and the wrath of the Lamb. My friend, this is terrible, terrible times. And you say, Dion, this is scaring me. <laughs> well, I want to say to you this morning, good, okay? Good. Because now, well, my understanding of what hell is like, and the bit I read in the Bible says the worm will never die, the flame will never cease. And I understand a little bit more about what Jesus, the very Son of God, went through, as we even heard last Sunday, the agony, the sweat drops of blood to save us from that certainty. Then, my friends, I would much rather get that shock treatment now because the words of Jesus says, See, I have told you beforehand. We have no excuse I know, I know this with all my heart because I've had the privilege even to preach to a group of atheists before at a funeral. (laughs) And I could see by preaching the gospel the conviction that set upon each and every one of them. That I got off that stage afterwards feeling so amazed. I'm like, Lord, these people do know the truth. (laughs) They're just stubborn and won't accept it. Jesus says, I've told you beforehand. If you're sitting here today (laughs) or you're listening to this message today, my friends, let it be known. You cannot even possibly let it enter into your mind and say, I did not know. You know. This is the word of God. You've been warned. These things are coming upon the earth. And then verse 7, he opened the fourth seal and I heard the voice of the four fourth living creature saying come and see and behold a pale horse and the name of whose uh, and the name of him who sat on it was death my friends capital D it's like death personified here and Hades followed him and I believe the distinction there is like death is what deals with our body Hades is what deals with the spiritual realm my friends when you die You know, don't believe the deception. Many people commit suicide today because they just want to be cut off from this world. It's the end. It's finished. I'm done. I cease to exist. I hate it on this planet. (laughs) That's not the end. My friends, that is not the end. And now we need to pray for people that are under that powerful depression and deception of the enemy that they should get to a place where they want to take their own life. And we see this pale horse death and Hades following him and power again was given to them notice this my friends God is in control my friends God is in control I love even when Jesus went to the cross you know it wasn't just chaos it wasn't Pilate and the mob that were dictating what was going to happen to him Jesus knew all the way through what was going to happen to him And only when Pilate challenged him and said, do you not know I have the authority, Jesus, to set you free or to have you crucified? Jesus corrected him and said, you can have no authority unless you receive it from above. Jesus knows who's in charge, my friends. Only these things have been given. Just like God allowed Satan, uh, 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 the, 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 the entrance into Job's life, you know, the same thing is happening here. It is God's mercy, it's his grace, even in his wrath. And we see death in Hades, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, my friends, I've heard many explanations of this before, and people say, well, if you just tally it all up throughout human history, yes, there's always been murders, there's been death, and all these things, and wars, and yes, there was. And if you could tally up all the numbers, you know, this, you could kind of make it work in the Bible. I don't believe it's just talking about times gone past. I believe this is talking about this specific time, this seven-year period. My friends, think about seven years. How quick does seven years go by? Yeah? Just the other day, I was thinking about the COVID lockdowns and everything. How many years has gone by since then? It's like, like that. Seven years is a very short space of time. And we're going to see these things. Well, those who dwell on the earth at that time are going to see these things in this measure, as it were. A fourth of the earth. And I looked yesterday. We're close to eight billion, they say, on the face of this planet today. And if you do the maths, a fourth of eight billion people to die by the sword, by famine, by hunger, my friends, that is a lot of people. And you can understand why the prophet Jeremiah, even back then, foresaw when he saw the slain of the Lord from the one end to the other end. 
corpses everywhere. I'm not trying to scare you this morning, my friends. This is the word of God. And we ignore this at our own peril. Pray for those in your family, your communities to come to faith, my friends. These things will surely come. And remember again, it is the lamb that was slain. John saw him as the lamb that was slain or, you know, just like a, a mess if you like. He's the one who's opening these things, my friends. What a picture. And then in verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Now remember in Matthew 24, Jesus spoke of much the same thing. He said many, uh, they will deliver you up, verse, verse 9, it says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. You know, Jesus spoke of this very thing. And we've got to see something very significant, as my dad who pointed this out uh, a, a while ago. And I believe this could be very true. I even raised it with Colin last week and asked him what he thinks of this. Could this be the souls of those who were slain purely and only because they were Jewish? Because remember again, this seven-year period is focused particularly and is known as the time of Jacob's trouble in the book of Jeremiah again. The 77s are determined for your people, your holy city, for the people of Israel. And so whilst we know there are going to be many martyrs in the time of the Great Tribulation, but there are also those who are just be persecuted purely, like we've seen again in history, Holocaust, six million Jews, my friends, died only purely because they are Jews. And I do believe, I think my dad's onto something here, that I do believe this could be, I'm not saying it is, but could well be a picture of these souls that are under the altar. Because what do they cry? They cry out for vengeance. How long, O Lord, holy and true? They believe in the God of Israel. They are Israel. <laughs> Although their eyes are not open to their Messiah, but it will be one day. And you contrast that to, to Stephen, for instance, when he was martyred. Remember, the first martyr. Did he cry out, oh Lord, how long before you avenge my blood on these people? No. He prayed quite different. He said, Father, do not hold this sin against them. He had the very spirit of Jesus in him. Do you see? And so we see this time of great tribulation. My friends, if you've not seen it yet, I hope you see it as we go through. It's God focusing back on his people, Israel. Because he's going to bring them to a place where they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when they finally, they as a nation, recognize their Messiah, Yeshua, <laughs> the Jesus the Christians were talking about, although they had it all wrong in a lot of different ways. But they will recognize this Jesus who came and walked amongst us is our Messiah. And oh no, we've killed him. And they'll mourn for him like one mourns for a brother. And they'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At that moment, my friends, you read the prophecies. That'll be the end of that seven-year tribulation. And that's when Jesus comes back. Like lightning flashes from the east to the west. says, every eye will see. <laughs> my friend, there's no secret thing happening. The king of glory will come back. And where does he come back to? He comes back to Zion. He comes back to rule and reign in Israel. And so I can see that this may well be the many, many people. The time of the tribulation is going to make the Holocaust look like something insignificant and small in its magnitude, my friends. These things are coming. The time of Jacob's trouble, and it will permeate throughout the whole world. But listen to the grace of God. He gives them a white robe, it's given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Let me say this again, my friends, because I've heard people say this before, okay? 
Well, if I don't come to the Lord now because I want to live my life the way I want now, well, there's always that time of the tribulation, and I know that many people are going to be saved out of the tribulation. Let me say to this to us now, my friends. The Bible is very clear. There are going to be two options for us in the tribulation, as we shall see. is to take the mark of the beast, and you are eternally damned if you do. Very clear. There's no repentance after that. Or you pay with your life. That is the only way, my friends. And we're going to go through the wrath. Those people will see the wrath of Almighty God, my friends. It's going to be a dreadful time. And none of us want to be there in that time. Don't ever say, I'll delay it till then. My master's delaying is coming. No, 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 no. No, these are dreadful things coming upon the earth. And then we'll finish with verse 12 to 17. It says, and then I looked and he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded. It's literally like it's rolled up. It says like a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For great, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? My friends, they ask that question at that point. The words of Jesus, I believe, in Matthew 24 is the end is still not yet. These are but the birth pangs. Already they've seen wars, famines, scarcity, death, all these catastrophes, if you like. Jesus' words to the world and to us is that is but still just the birth pangs. We've not even got into the trumpets and the bowls when it gets seriously, seriously ramped up a few levels, my friends. But even at this point, they ask the question, who is able to stand? That people would hide themselves. And I believe this is going to be actual supernatural events, cosmic events actually then beginning to take place as it then begins to move away from the, just the consequences of man-made warfare and all these things that God has allowed to take place. There's going to be a receding of the sky as it were rolled up and people will be able to see something into the spiritual realm and they'll recognize who's really in charge and they'll want to hide from his face. Later on in the book of Revelation, you even talk about people will seek death and even death will flee from them. How is that possible? Well, I believe at that time, people will surely know how that is possible. It seems so outrageous to even write that in John's time. Yes, things that are yet future, my friends. Now we ask ourselves again in closing, why? Why, Lord? Why must it be this way? Why did it have to be this way? My friends, it is because we are fallen and we are full of wickedness. And I read this from Acts um, chapter 17. Remember when Paul was speaking to the people on Mars Hill. And he begins to preach to them because they had all these gods and, uh, and he found this one inscription, the one altar with the inscription that says, to the unknown God. And Paul saw that as his entry, as it were. Now I want to proclaim to you this unknown God. Okay, you want to worship everything and everything and worship all the creation and all that stuff, but at least you recognize there's an unknown God out there because, <laughs> my friends, it's, so, it's in our nature. It's in, it, it, God put eternity in our hearts. No matter what religion you're in, God put eternity in our hearts. And that is why, like I said to you before, even when I had the privilege to preach to a bunch of atheists, I could see conviction there. There's that God-given thing there that they know. I have a maker, and I'm going to answer to him one day. And so Paul used that as an opportunity to speak to them about this unknown God. And he says in verse 26, uh, from Acts 17, and, he, and he's preaching to them now. All these people, you know, these are Gentiles. These are not Jews. These are the clever philosophers of his day. 
And he says, And he, God, made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Do you know God is so close to you, my friends? He's just wanting you like a prodigal son to come running back. (laughs) And the wonderful picture that we have in the Bible is the father comes running down the street to meet you halfway. He is not far from any of us. Even in our state of unbelief, the time of grace is now. And then in verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. God created us. And also some, as, as also some of your own poets have said, he says to them, for we are also his offspring. Where do I come from? <laughs> Even the most intelligent minds today don't necessarily always accept the whole evolution thing anymore. No, there's a higher power out there. And then Paul says to them, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, okay, We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked. What a statement. God saw people worshiping their creatures and their creation rather than the creator and made these gods of gold and wood and whatever and stone and bowed down to them. It says God, even in that time of ignorance, overlooked it, even though we see great judgment. But in the grand scheme of things, God overlooked these things. But now, second half of verse 30, but now commands men everywhere to repent. What's changed? What has changed that God overlooked these things? But now he commands, it's a strong word, men everywhere to repent, my friends, because of, because he sent his son God sent his son to save us when none were looking for him. Not one, the Bible says. This is the, you know, the Bible talks, behold the goodness and the severity of our God. His grace and his, his amazing, as the great old song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But my friends, on the flip side of that, my, my God is an awesome God. He's a consuming fire. He is holy. No unrighteousness can stand in his presence. And his love for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And now he commands men. We are living in this time of grace where that command is still going out. He commands men everywhere, repent. Turn to God, my friends. Turn to Jesus. Because he has appointed a day, verse 31, on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Nobody's going to be able to take it for an appeal and say, that wasn't a fair judgment, I'm appealing this judgment. No such thing with God. It's going to be a righteous judgment. So God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. How? By the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When Jesus rose from the dead, my friends, he became the first fruits of those who were raised from the dead unto God, my friends, making a way for every single one of us who should believe in his name to not perish in death and Hades to be eternally separated from him but to have life in his name sent shockwaves throughout the whole spiritual realm but we cannot get away from the fact that he will judge this world and the reason God's going to judge this world it's because people made in his very image, whom he loves so much, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And I'm only but doing my God-given duty this morning to echo the words of my loving Lord and Savior, Jesus, my Messiah, my friends, and your Messiah. See 
I have told you beforehand. Oh, let these words grip your heart, my friends. There is a time coming on this earth such as never been and never will be again. The Bible is so clear. And that is why we are so called upon as a church to pray for the lost, to reach them, my friends. Pray for our lost family and our friends. To pray as we do for the people of Israel, my friends, because we know what the Holy Scriptures teach us about them and the things that will unfold there, my friends. And we can pray that they be saved, even if it be but a few. Their eyes would open and they too would, you know, we'd be all together with the body of Christ and we'd be raptured to be with Him on the clouds of glory. You know, it says very clearly, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9 to 10. I'll close with this. You can have a look at this with me and underline it in your Bible. I'm sure you know it. But what comforting words these are to us. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9 to 10. I'll close with this. Because there are many people that teach today, good, solid, respectable Bible teachers, my love and respect, but will teach today that we are going to go through this time of tribulation, and even the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, yes? The last three and a half years is really what's known as the great tribulation. I don't believe that, okay? And the reason I don't is because Jesus spoke in the seven letters, you know, we will be kept from that time of wrath. But then these famous words in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, it says very clearly, and Paul is talking here about the last days, my friend. He says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Is he only talking about him and the apostles? No, he's not. He's talking to the believers. Okay? He's talking to the church at Thessalonica. All those who believe in Jesus, even after them. You and me, even today, if we believe in Jesus. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. How? Because he died, or who died for us. And whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Jesus says, see, I've told you beforehand, my friends. Don't take my word for it. Go read the prophecies for yourself. Let it put in you a new, what's a zeal to pray for the lost. And to seek the Lord, even like Daniel did when he knew their time of captivity was coming to an end, to pray and to intercede and to stand in the gap for those that need to know the truth. Amen? I know Dave and Jill's prepared a song, so maybe you can come up, Dave and Jill, and then if you're able just to stand with me today. And, um, you know, first and foremost, just challenge each and every one of us, you know, as this same word challenges me when I read it and study it, as, you know, am I ready? Lord, am I really ready when that trumpet should sound? Am I going to be found doing your work, or am I going to be one of your evil servants that's got the attitude of you delaying your coming, and I turn and I drink with the drunkards, and I beat my fellow servants, and I gossip and I slander, and I say all kinds of things that I shouldn't. Engaging in the things of this world, when I should be wholly committed to service to my king, knowing that the time is at hand. And then maybe there are those who are listening today that don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. And you think, Dion, what is all this gobbledygook you're on about? But something inside of me is tugging away that I need to know the truth. Well, my friends, there's a word for you today. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised. <laughs> all things will continue. God's prophecies will unfold. But this could be my last day. It could be your last day on the face of this planet. Make sure that today you are found in Jesus. Call upon his name. Turn from your wicked ways and receive from him this grace. So, Father, we just commit this into your hands. Holy Spirit, I can't do your work as your job, your role, your work to convict the world of sin and, Lord, and of all those truths. And, Lord, to glorify the name of Jesus. So, Lord, precious Lord, would you just move amongst us now? Lord, in great power and might, would you just speak to every single one of us here, Lord, right where we're at. You know exactly what we're going through right now. Oh, precious Lord, would you minister to us this day in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we come and we bring this song of praise and worship to you now, would you even speak to us and confirm your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave.